Welcome, my name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. I would also like to thank the Lexington Historical Society for partnering with us on this program. Copies of the author's book will be available for purchase through Maxima Book Center. Brian's in the back of the room, and Bob will be happy to sign a copy for you at the end of the program. Lex Media is recording this event, and it will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. So for any of your friends who haven't been able to make it tonight, it will be recorded. We are going to take questions at the end of the program, so please raise your hand so I can bring over a microphone so everyone can hear your question. Tonight, Bob Gross and Paul O'Shaughnessy will talk about the roads to revolution, the different paths of Lexington and Concord. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. Robert A. Gross is a James L. and Shirley A. Draper Professor of Early American History Emeritus at the University of Connecticut, a specialist in the social and cultural uh, history of the United States from the Revolution to the Civil War. Sorry, Gross particularly focuses particularly on New England. His first book, The Minuteman and Their World, presents a community study of Concord, Massachusetts in the 18th century, portraying the lives and circumstances of inhabitants at all levels of the social order and tracing the internal conflicts that shaped the town's participation in the mobilization against British rule. Paul O'Shaughnessy currently serves as a member of the Lexington 250th Commission. He is also a board member and past president of Lexington Historical Society, president of the Friends of Minuteman Park, quartermaster and officer in His Majesty's 10th Regiment of Foot and current chair of the Lexington Historic Districts Commission. In his spare time, Paul serves as technical director at the Footlight Club Theater in Jamaica Plain and is an engineering director at Covaris LLC, a biotech in Woburn. Welcome, Bob and Paul. I'm going to hand the mic over to you, Paul, too. A couple of slackers up here. <laughs> um, well, so I grew up in Lexington and you live in Concord. And so we instantly have a little bit of a, something to say to each other here, don't we? <clears throat> um, so I think that as an opening, first of all, I brought along my copy from the 1980s of the Minutemen and their world. And um, this is, as you can see, rather dog-eared and such. Um, and uh, I read it quite a long time ago, but, um, what fascinated me about this is so many people read, you know, they write about the battle, and they, that's about it. This talks about the people, and I'm stealing some of this from you, but, but it makes for a fascinating read. You cannot understand what happened until you start to understand the people. Then it starts to make some sense. But a lot of folks, uh, when, they, when they think of the American Revolution, and particularly Lexington Concord and things of that nature, they tend to simplify a bit. They sort of see it as a linear progression towards rebellion, and then of course we win and hurrah, and it's all, you know, the rest is history. Um, I'm going to just throw you a softball and say it was a little more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, this book's been out for a good while, but I've actually never spoken in Lexington. And so I feel as if we, <laughs> we finally gotten past 1825. <laughs> but maybe we can say something about that tonight. So let me answer Paul's question by telling you about how I came to conceive of the Minutemen and their world as a book. And that is the bicentennial was approaching in the mid-1970s. I was working on a PhD dissertation that was going to be called Land Population and Society in Concord, Massachusetts. Boy, that would have really sold a lot of books. But I was visiting the National Park Service's headquarters at the Buttrick Mansion. And looking at the diorama that is still displayed there with all the forces arrayed on the landscape, 
and it realized that they'd been frozen in time. Like the figures on the old on the Grecian urn. Forever waiting to be unleashed in history. And I thought to myself, Concord had a history before April 1970, and it had a history after. And that day I realized, why not write a book that asks not why was there an American Revolution, but how and why was there an American Revolution in the history of Concord? And he answered that question. You'd have to know something about the people of Concord. That was my second sort of animating idea, which is that people would write about Captain John Parker, a farmer, a woodworker, or Colonel Buttrick, owner of, or Colonel Barrett, owner of the vast farm on Barrett's Mill Road, as if they knew anything about them other than a label. And I thought, could I do something different from what was common, which is people have often assumed that people in the past are just like themselves. It's only they wear funny clothes and wigs. And things. <laughs> what if we didn't assume that they were just like us, but that I tried to figure out what their world was, not just how they made a living, but how they thought about making a living, how they conducted politics, and what was the political culture. So the big idea was, could I get at a world that was distinctly different from our own? But could I do it deeply enough that I could present them as different and yet also come to see that they dealt with human issues that we could, in fact, make a connection with? Um, and, and I believe your new one, we should compare them just a bit here. This one's thicker, the, the, the new one. This one gained weight over the years. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe some of that weight is Lexington, is it not? Yes. Right. So you need to buy it because there's more in there about Lexington. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I will keep adding towns as they invite me to speak. <laughs> and, and so the, the final edition will be known as the self-regarding edition of Massachusetts. Right. Um, so the, uh, the, as far as the two different towns, I think that we, again, have an illusion that all of the people who lived in this part of Massachusetts were uniformly outraged by the various acts, the Massachusetts Act and the various intolerable acts, and as one rose up and, uh, and, and did what they did on April 19th and at all of the other places. But again, I, I believe that uh, there was some conservatism and there, was, there were significant pockets of loyalty so if you might be able to talk about that a little bit and maybe work Lexington and Concord into that. Okay, so do you all remember how tedious it was in school to have to f memorize? There was a stamp act, and then though they repealed it, and then there was a, what was that, the declaratory act, and then there was uh, towns and duties, whoever Townsend was, and then, and you keep marching through, and, and every so often there's something that happened outside of Massachusetts. But mostly, you memorize all that. And the problem is, not just to be tedious to have to memorize all that. It's also that it makes the American Revolution sound like Britain acted, Americans reacted, then Britain reacted again, taking in the reaction, but then as if Americans are always sort of in the defense, on the defense. And it misses again the kind of larger way in which things unfolded. Let me just answer you, go to the chase quickly. Concord, I had thought from the fact that it was the site of the so-called first battle of the revolution, 
I and that it it was one of the You're on thin ice already. I, <laughs> you notice I said so called. And Bob that, Gross everybody. It was it was the home of the Minutemen. So it was easy to think with the books that had been done, but Concord was militant from the start. And I thought what I was originally going to do was take a standard story well known and add to it the social history of Concord. So I go to the Concord Free Public Library to look through the town minute book to read the different resolutions against British policy. And in Concord, it was said by Lebiel Shattuck, adopted in reaction to the Stamp Act, the Braintree Resolves, which had been written by John Adams, and many towns were enacting. And in fact, the town passed whatever statement they made and instructed the town clerk to write the resolutions in the town book. So I go cheerfully off to read the resolutions, and I get to the meeting in October 1765. There's nothing there. So I was looking at a transcription, and I said, can, you, can I read the original? So they bring it out, hoping I won't wreck it. And I look, there's nothing there. Apparently, the town clerk, even though he was told to inscribe these resolutions in the book for posterity, was maybe more worried about the British and the royal governor who might go check the town book for seditious statements. And then, put on my guard, I start to realize that Concord's resolutions about British policies were at times non-existent and at other times moderate and cautious. And it would not be until the summer August, September of 1774, that you can really say that Concord had joined the opposition in a forceful way. Lexington, by contrast, was a town ready to confront the British authorities from the very moment the Stamp Act was passed. So much so that Lexington could certainly resent Concord for getting all the credit for starting a battle in a revolution that it tried to hold off for a decade, while Lexington was ready from the get-go in 1765. And I thought I would read to you the resolution in 1765 that Lexington passed. Our worthy ancestors, after many struggles with their enemies, in the face of every danger, at the expense of much treasure and blood, secured to themselves and transmitted to us their posterity, a fair and rich inheritance, not only of a pleasant and fertile land, but also of invaluable rights and privileges, both as men and Christians. As stated in the royal charter of this province, and secured to us by the faith of the British crown and kingdom. End of quote. Long sentence. Having received so precious a legacy, they went on, it was their duty to preserve and protect it and pass it on intact to the next generation. And then they say that this whether that thus, whether successful or not, succeeding generations might know that we understood our rights and liberties and were neither afraid nor ashamed to assert and maintain them, and that we ourselves may have at least the consolation in our chains. It was not through our neglect that this people were enslaved. Okay, that is one defiant statement. Concord passed the Braintree Resolves and didn't write it down. Concord's statement in the Braintree Resolves say, oh, the Stamp Act is such a burden on trade, we can't afford it, it'll cause a depression. 
And merchants in England, you'll suffer as much as we do here. And besides that, it's unconstitutional. We've been guaranteed by our charter to write the tax ourselves through our assembly. Both of those arguments on grounds of economy and on grounds of the Constitution could be made by people who were moderates and conservatives. But the statement made by Lexington is something different. It's what I call the inheritance meme, the appeal to the ancestors. Think about it. The whole Puritan migration is invoked. They left England to escape the tyranny of Charles I and of Archbishop Laud, and they suffered so much. They shed blood they crossed the ocean. They risked their lives. They risked their fortunes. They fought in the wars against the native peoples, all so that they could establish a legacy to pass on to their children, their children's children. And how could we possibly betray it by not being true? to what they have given us. That is not just an argument. It's an appeal that I would say is to identity politics. Our very identity as the descendants of Puritans is at stake. We have to live up to it. And it's even, if you will, a kind of ethnic nationalism. The descendants of the Puritan English settlers are those to whom we owe everything. And ethnic nationalism, that is not at all what Jefferson has in mind when he writes the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. That's a revolution that can appeal to people of color, to people who are oppressed all over the world. But the appeal to the Puritan's inheritance is more restrictive. Moreover, what they're talking about here is our charter, given it to us. They're actually meaning not the charter um, of 1629-30, but rather of 1691 from William and Mary that guaranteed things. If the charter, which is the last straw for the, before the revolution in Massachusetts, the charter's revoked. And what they're saying is, respect our charter, and we're loyal to the crown. We're loyal to parliament. So Lexington is already adopting this rhetoric and this position as soon as the Stamp Act is passed. Concord won't get to that until 1774. And then the big question is, huh, they seem so alike. Why so different? Well, then I will ask that question. Why so different? Um, but I'll ask it in a certain way. <clears throat> Lexington and Concord, well, Lexington was a part of Cambridge that had calved off and had been originally, many of you might know, it was known as Cambridge Farms. It was an outlying part of Cambridge. Um, and so my impression is that Lexington was decidedly more rural than Concord. Uh, it was a, a younger town in that regard, and it had its own parish for a shorter period of time. So Concord is the more established place, perhaps more wealthy, things like that. Is that what's playing into this, and is that the difference between the two towns? Partly. How, how many of you know what year Lexington was incorporated as a town? Oh, well, he, yeah. not, don't ask him. <laughs> 1713, is that right? Okay. Concord, what year? 1635. 1635. Good. Now we're down to the really the low point of history teaching when you make people memorize facts. <laughs> but. But it's significant. Yeah. Um, so in 1775, Lexington is a backwater. It has something like 750 people living here. Concord is twice the size with more than 1,500. And it is a court town, a seat of the Middlesex County Courts. It is a market center. It's a place whose village hosts the civic buildings, the courthouse, the meeting house. 
and it is a hub of activity. It's also a place where, from the wars with native peoples in the 17th century, is accustomed to being a staging ground for military expeditions. Amazingly, on the night of April 18th, 19th, in 16, I think it's 1689, people from Concord, men from Concord gather to march on Boston and overthrow the royal regime. April 19 is like a sacred date in Concord. Mm -hmm. So Concord is richer, more populous than little Lexington. No one could have imagined then that in our own time, the population of Lexington is nearly twice that of Concord. And when you want to compare wealth, the median price of a house is higher here than in Concord. So you've won. <laughs> Hooray. But, <laughs> right, when you get your tax bill, remember yes. that. Yes, as I like to say, how's the taxation with representation? <laughs> so, Here's the crucial thing. I'm going to recount both what I wrote in Miniman and what Mary Schur did in an influential article in New England Quarterly comparing Lexington and Concord using what I did in looking at Lexington. So, Concord is a wealthier town and it has a lot to do with it. But it's also a farming town. And there's two different lines of analysis. As a farming town, it is by the 1750s and 60s in its fourth and maybe even fifth generation. The farms are established by those English settlers with a vision of husbandry and patriarchy that makes for a world very different from what we think today. Fathers, you know, aimed to establish their family lines on the land and pass on um, property to their sons and daughters. And in the early years of English settlement, the grants to the original proprietors in a town like Concord were large and ample enough to provide for children as they came of age. The farms themselves were uh, practice what was called mixed husbandry, in which they're aiming primarily to sustain their own families, but to get enough of a surplus to sell, you know, uh, slaughter a, a cow or two and sell them for market. Um, or, um, you know, and, and use, use the profits to be able to buy things at the store, they pay their taxes, or they um, exchange with neighbors, um, not in a barter system, in a, but goods for goods, goods for labor. So you have that kind of world, but by the 1720s, it's already the case that families are you know, so abundant, children are living so long, that the biblical um, dictum, you know, they'd be fruitful and multiply, proved to be the case. So. Increasingly, children would have to move away. And fathers would do as much as they could to acquire land in other towns um, to provide for their sons and make good marriages for daughters. By the 1720s, a good many people in Concord are moving to what would be southern Worcester County and starting new towns. After the French and Indian Wars are settled, they're moving to central, to northern Worcester and central Middlesex, and then up a cattle trail to New Hampshire, and then others are settling as far away as Vermont or Maine. That matters because the family arrangements for these patriarchal farms um, are going to come unstuck when there's not enough land for the kids. It's in the interest of children to move away as uh, of sons as f soon as possible so that they can get land when it's there for the cheap or free. But it's in the interest of the fathers to keep sons at home 
working on the family farm as long as possible so that they can take care of the land and the other kids. What happens then is you have generational tensions between fathers and sons and mothers and, and fathers and daughters. And one way this has worked out is in changing um, sexual practices before marriage. In the Puritan time, you know, um, fornication is punished severely, and there are very few marriages made um, in which anybody's going to wear a scarlet letter, um, in which um, any children are going to be born fewer than nine months after the wedding. But the way to negotiate the independence of the young to go off and make marriages on their own turned out to be um, not, I think, as a deliberate decision, but as something that people kind of came to. The average age of first marriage for a man is about 25, 26. For a woman, about 21, 22. In such a world, you're talking about people who were sexually mature for a long time before they, and especially men, before they marry. But you begin to see, starting in the 1730s and 40s, more and more children are being born within nine months or fewer of the wedding. And that suggests that there's a kind, of, but there are very few illegitimate births. Some kind of negotiation is going on in the family. Mm -hmm. And so, let me bring us to the point. Patriarchy is under pressure. And this is in, by the eve of the revolution in Concord, in the two decades before the battle, something like 33% of all first births have been conceived before, um, bef um, before the wedding. Mary Fuhrer finds the exact same thing is true in Lexington. Mm -hmm. Likewise, about two thirds of Concord's young men in the quarter century before the revolution move away from Concord. She finds ditto for Lexington. Mm -hmm. So Lexington and Concord are actually in many ways quite alike. By the way, you might say, and I'm surprised you aren't already rising up and saying, how do you know this? How do you know about these people's sexual habits? What did you read? Who, who, who blew the whistle on them? So anybody here, you look like a group old enough to have done this. Anybody here go to a wedding? Then you heard that a baby was born sometime after. And you suddenly said to yourself, huh, gee, when was that wedding? And what, what do you do? You what? No, no, but what would you do? When, you wouldn't go to the church records today. When you heard that somebody, um, you count on your fingers, right? You started coming back, what was that wedding? Well, what you do as amateurs, as gossip, I do for a living. <laughs> so as a historian, I made this whole database of all the marriages in Concord in this time. And then, when was the first baby registered? So I elevated your neighborly gossip, which you should be apologizing for. I turned it into systematic social science. And made and, a living. <laughs> and so, and I found out that Concord and Lexington shouldn't have had such a fight since they looked like each other in so many ways. When land is getting tight and there's not enough for all the kids, this is a world in which landlessness will spread. And it turns out, 1771, both Lexington and Concord, about a third of the male population is landless. So you've got growing economic pressure. You have growing out migration. You have a challenge to the authority of fathers. And this is a world that's not just one of patriarchy, but also one of, uh, it's hierarchical, but it's inclusive. And so, in town meeting, people are, are expected, on the one hand, to seek unanimity. When the town clerk records the vote, he'll write, the town voted. They rarely ever do a roll call vote. 
They want harmony. They want consensus. They want Concord. As true in Lexington as in Concord. And so, and, and um, when a way you can understand this culture of hierarchy is to think about how they sat the meeting house. I noticed that when you all came in, did anybody tell you where to sit? Did you just take anything you wanted? You did? Well, if you were going to the meeting house in the 1770s in Lexington or in Concord, you couldn't sit where you wanted. There was a formal vote by town meeting to seat the meeting house. Mm -hmm. Now, men on one side, women on the other. Women took the status of their husbands in a world of patriarchy. They were dependent variables. Everybody over 70, all the men and the women attached to them, got to sit in the front rows. But then the rich 60-year-olds in Concord got better seats than the middling and poor 60-year-olds who wound around until you got to the rich 50-year-olds. And then nobody under 30 ever got on the first floor. And blacks, they had no formal place, but they were seated on the margins. Age, wealth, community service. People deferred to them. Okay. So I've now described to you this world of hierarchy and patriarchy, but it's also coming apart. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, how is Con so if Lexington and Concord are similar in, in enduring the same social changes that in many ways are traumatic, then how come Lexington was radical and Concord wasn't? Mm -hmm. Here's the other part. Concord is a cosmopolitan place. It's serving as a court town. It's serving as a market center. And it has a number of officials who all have appointments from the royal government. Uh -huh, yes. Justices of the peace, uh, high officials in the court system, um, militia top officers, all and the minister of the town. All these people are both locally rooted, but also extra locally connected. And in those connections, if, you're, if you are Colonel Charles Prescott, Colonel John Cumming, you get patronage from the royal government. One of the forms of patronage that's really important is that Massachusetts, as people are expanding in the search for land, Massachusetts, having defeated Native peoples, is giving out those lands in big land grants. And they're selling, I should say, giving out the, they're selling off townships. Mm -hmm. And then, in effect, the people who buy the townships are like developers. They're helping to settle an area. Right. And they subdivide. Uh, and they subdivide. So the people in Concord who are actively involved in this are, if when you think about it, really optimistic. You're not going to buy a township and hope to sell it expecting to have an American Revolution. Right. And so, There's a lot to lose. And these people are characteristically the slaveholders in the town, the enslavers. Why? Not because they're like tobacco planters or rice planters, but because ownership of house servants for life is a status symbol for people who identify with the British Empire. So what we have is that the distinguished local leadership in Concord is I, tied to the world of the empire. And they imagine themselves as the counterparts to the aristocracy and the gentry of Great Britain. So now you've got two things going. On the one hand, a town suffering Lexington and Concord, a great many of the same social forces, same economic and social upheaval. And it, on the other hand, Lexington doesn't even have a retail store. 
Lexington doesn't have any colonels living in the town. It is really a backwater in this regard. And so the, the point being that, a point would be that the, the people in Concord, they have certainly more of these ties, much more to lose. Uh, and as things get difficult, it hits the more rural and the, the, the I would say, less wealthy first. Is that a night? Would that does that actually hold some water? Not sure if if we. I mean, it is true that the more rural groups are the quickest to embrace the um, line of what we owe our ancestors. But there are many rural communities, especially in Western Massachusetts, that actually just want to be left alone, mm -hmm. who don't respond at all to the alarms that the Boston Committee of Correspondent is, is sending out. I don't think it's so much that they're badly hurt, mm -hmm. but we can say they're not conflicted. Right, they don't have these other associations that we, they would have to abandon. Right. right, but there's a further thing here, which is kind of what I argued strongly in the first version of Minutemen, and that is that comes to the question of why did Concord wait till the summer of 1774 before it rose up in fury. And that is, all these different tax taxes that you're forced to remem memorize, they come and go, and like the taxes on the towns and duties and the tax on tea, well, just don't drink tea. Not that big a problem. But when, in retaliation for the Tea Party, Parliament passes the so called Intolerable Acts, it revokes the Charter of Massachusetts, which Lexington et al. had been worried about in 1765. It revokes the Charter and it bars all town meetings without the governor's consent. They can have just one a year, and the governor has to approve the agenda. So what Britain is doing is overturning local self-governance. When it does that, this is the first time they invade the township. They're going to control the militia. They're going to get rid of the council. Uh, except there's an appointed body, and no more town meetings, no more local, and no more local juries to control the administration of justice. What Britain does is it threatens people like King Concord who are already losing control of their local life through the challenges to patriarchy, the out-migration of the young, the struggles against landlessness, the conflicts in town meeting over issues that I haven't mentioned, but that shattered the desire for unanimity in the town. Losing control of their local autonomy, finding that the inherited way of life is fraying. In that context, what Britain does is say, we're going to really take away your control of your local life. And to people who are already anxious about their control over their own affairs, this is the last straw. And, and this corresponds with the final radicalization of Concord and indeed everywhere. Exactly. Right. So when you find, you know, I, I, did, I think, draw um, my sense of life in the 20th century in writing the book, but think of the residents. What does it mean to appeal to the ancestors and your duty to pass on their legacy to posterity when you can't pass on their material legacy, the land, to posterity? I don't know that there's a causal argument to be made, but there's a kind of resonance here. That somehow you feel like, 
people in the background of their thinking is, we can't even pass on land to our kids. We can't even pass on the world of our fathers. Let's appeal to the world of our fathers. Pulling the charters undermines all of that. Yeah, right. exactly it, it, so. it destroys the, that hope, right? Yeah. Exactly. So in effect, I'm arguing that Concord doesn't radicalize until Britain really threatens their control of their own affairs in local life. And so I, I'm going to segue a bit because th if we can, now can skip over the revolution and take us ahead about 50 years. Can you talk a bit about why the two towns have had this problem for so long? <laughs> well, it's actually due to the fact that in 1775, on April 20th, the leaders of the Provincial Congress realized, we got to get our version of events out to England before royal governor can do it. So what's happening in Concord and in Lexington on April 20th and 21, 22, is justices of the peace are taking depositions from, from people who were here for in, in Lexington from all the people who said, oh, we didn't do anything, we didn't fire any shots, we were innocent, we were dispersing when, when we were told to disperse, and they fired on us. And in Concord... You've heard that before, haven't you? <laughs> and in Concord... They were taking these positions that said, well, we marched towards the bridge because we thought they were burning the town down and we didn't fire because our commander said don't fire until fired upon. And then we fired back. So that's the story. No colonists started anything. It was always the Redcoats' fault. Yes, I admit it. <laughs> Had war not broken out the way it did, there would have been the Boston Massacre, the Lexington Massacre, and the Concord Triumph. So now we're in 1825. Actually, in 1824, when Lafayette came to Lexington and to Concord. That's where it really that's where it starts. Started. Right. Samuel Hoare, the distinguished figure who is often thought of as the man of Concord who led everything, though he was actually more controversial than that. He greets Lexington and says, you were here at the first sight of American resistance to British tyranny. Well, in 1825, as that get, boast gets around, Lexington is not happy. And a newcomer to Lexington named Elias Finney, who I think ends up with a job as he's a lawyer and clerk of courts. But he's a newcomer. So maybe he's seizing the cause of Lexington for political advantage so he can climb the ranks here. He is outraged and he gets assigned to gather all the depositions to show that Lexington, in fact, fired first or at least engaged in organized resistance to the British. Now, it's pretty darn clear that there was no organized combat on Lexington Green. The British officers, when they tried to get control of their troops, certainly didn't think there was organized combat. No, they did not, right. So, but the, this begins the argument over who deserves credit. And crucially here, you could ask the question, why does this matter? It Can't matters. We... <laughs> well, but, you know, something's changed that being first matters. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with, in effect, how both Lexington and Concord are reformulating their civic identities in response to new waves of social change. Popular democracy, a market revolution, expansion of the sights of people through mass printing and, and the like to imagine a wider world. And each wants to be seen as at the head of the line. Actually, I think of this now, maybe because 
most of America's future will, it will become evident is in the West. And as still greater exodus is taking place from Concord and Lexington to settle places in the West, what do you have left as your kids are going ever farther away and you might never see them again? You hold to the notion, we were first. Okay. I'm going to, I, we've, uh, it's about an hour, so we've got about 10 minutes left. So I think it's a good time to maybe take a question or two. So, yes, in the back. Oh, thank you so much. A striking moment in that discussion to me as we in Lexington, both communities, um, organize our celebration of 250 is that 250, 250 years ago, this very night was, uh, and this, this very spring, was the, the reaction to the Tea Party uh, and the subsequent events was sweeping this state. And, you know, I've, I've seen the, the records of the Provincial Congress and all of that. But that's the way we should really understand this year, 2024, is the 250th anniversary almost of the real revolution. The point that you make about Concord's reaction to the Intolerable Acts and their impact on local government. Is that, is that properly understood? Is there a lot to work with there? Um, I'm not entirely sure you understand. You're saying that you think the revolution should be seen as beginning with the reaction to the tea, to the tea party? Yeah, and that, you know, obviously the, the, the tea party uh, was the, the, the dramatic action, but that the, um, the, the American response to um, the intolerable acts is really what radicalizes and makes revolution inevitable. This, this, you know, 200 and the, this is the semi-quincentennial of that. Yeah, I, I think that, that's exactly so. That it, it's dumping the tea provokes the British retaliation. That's really, finally the crackdown. Right. You know, we're gonna get those colonists and, and, and yeah, and so why do the, all those gentlemen with British, with crown appointments, mm -hmm. few of them become loyalists. How come? I think it's because they saw themselves as the counterparts in status and authority to the gentry in Great Britain. Right. They believed that they were equal subjects of king and parliament. Mm -hmm. And what they were told is that, no, you will always be second-class subjects of the British Empire. Now, when that becomes clear, it seems to me, people whose loyalties were divided, because many of these gentry in Concord were descendants of Puritans. Mm -hmm. They're suddenly you know, caught between loyalty to, the loyalty to the ancestors and what will now be disloyalty to those who reject you. And they shift back mm -hmm. to, and, and, and let me add, in appealing to the ancestors, I, I describe this as kind of an ethnic nationalism. And, it's, and what, when I was thinking about this way, it occurred to me, it's like the Serbs who go back to the Battle of the Crows, back in the, you may recall this from the wars and, and um, um, back in the late 90s. But the appeal to the ancestors, so this is the original radicalism, as I'm going to just repeat, it's not the radicalism of 1776. Mm -hmm. And we could ask ourselves a question, how did Massachusetts go, how did Concord go, from the appeal to the ancestors to fighting a far more universalist-minded revolution? That's a, that, that'll be another lecture, right? <laughs> yeah, um, and of course this touches on, I think it's Adams who speaks of the revolution in the hearts and the minds of the people having already taken place long before the shots are fired. Uh, is there another question? Do we have anything? Can, can I just yeah, go right. Um, as, as you said in 
1774 that the Concord had finally had it with all these acts and all this thing, but, but you kept alluding to uh, 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 had, he, saying that it, Concord had had it in 1774. Was there one more specific thing that turned them or just the buildup of whatever? I think it was, it, it's the intolerable acts. It's the invasion of the town. It's taking away the power of towns to control their own affairs. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, could you, with the uh, the, the contrast in uh, ministers between Lexington Concord, may have uh, had some. When you want to, you know, talk to that contrast and where that may have uh, led the people of one town to be a little bit more radical than the other. Um, well, Jonas Clark was considerably older and better established as a minister in Lexington than was William Emerson in Concord. Um, William Emerson was named minister in Concord in 1764. And by then, I think, Clark had been minister for a dozen years, 1752, if I remember. Something like that. Something like that. Um, actually, the two men were not that far apart in their perspectives, but Clark presided over a unified church. Emerson presided over a church that had already been split under his predecessor, Daniel Bliss, who was an evangelical in the Great Awakening. And when Emerson takes up the pulpit, it turns out he inherits the enemies of his predecessor. And by 1775, Concord, uh, the church is still split. There's a minority faction that's aggrieved, and nobody can hold communion service while there's an aggrieved faction. And so it would not be so much that William Emerson was not as radical as Jonas Clark. It's that he had a different political situation in the pews that he had to deal with. But by 1775, in February of that year, at a militia muster in Concord, Emerson preaches a sermon in which he goes through all the same. We owe it to the ancestors. They suffered under British tyranny and the whole inheritance thing. We owe it to them. So Concord and Lexington are with their ministers on the same note. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it strikes me how this starts as a uh, defense of rights of Englishmen and loyalty to the crown, that the crown is seen as the, as the protector of such rights until suddenly they're not. And, and that's, again, to 1774. For the longest time, a great many people are, are, are seeing that, well, there are these scoundrels in parliament. If we could just talk to the king, that would solve it, until they realize that the king is, is behind this too. And that... That's when you, he right. turns into King George. In, in, a, in a sense, you could say, um, for all the appeal to the ancestors, it doesn't become revolution mm. until people connect the dots. They see, oh yeah, there was those towns and duties and those other things. That, there's a conspiracy against us at the highest levels of the British government and in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And that conspiracy against us means to enslave us. So once people who appeal to the ancestors connect the dots and see the conspiracy, then they're just about ready, but there's one other thing they have to do. They have to be willing to coordinate and concert with others, with other towns, with other colonies. And that, again, isn't really going to happen until 1774-75 with the Continental Congresses. But the people who are the more conservative get really upset at the appeal to other towns through committees of correspondence and the appeal to other colonies with the Massachusetts Circular Letter. What they say is, you who so oppose these British taxes, who say that they're unconstitutional. Could you tell us 
Where in the Charter of Massachusetts it's established the town should appoint committees of correspondence and communicate with one another? Don't we already have the right to elect a representative from our town and give him instructions to present in the assembly when it meets? And who ever heard of appealing to other colonies in letters to coordinate? Don't we already have the power to send a humble petition and appeal to the king and ask for a redress of grievances? It's not us who are unconstitutional. It's you, Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty. You are violating the British Constitution and the Royal Charter. I couldn't it's have said it better your myself. Fault. <laughs> and so, and, and the truth be told, this is the part of the American Revolution that nobody writes about. The people who made this case were hooted down and shouted down and threatened with tar and feathering. There's no great free speech regime in which people are debating what to do. Right. This, this is, at the end of the day, it's also a revolution. It's a war, and, and it's very serious. Um, but it's also a parallel government being set up under under everyone's noses, or right in front of their faces, and that's, that's what they're, they're objecting to. And yet, on April 19th, as the Minutemen and militia companies marched from the hill towards the North Bridge, held by the British regulars, nobody knew what had happened in Lexington. And they were under orders not to start a war but let the British fire first. Which they did. Yeah. Are we, how, are we, how are we on time? We have time for maybe one more question. Sure, is there another one? I'm sure somebody, if not, I'll have one. Oh, there you go, go ahead. Uh, well, I don't want to change books on you, but uh, you've written a book about transcendentalism. Oh. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, and yeah. for those of us who are working on Lexington's 19th century, um, can you make a few comments about um, how the towns compare when it's time to be anti-slavery and it's time to organize themselves for the Civil War? Well, I do know about the Stone Church and the Lycia movement here, and also about Waldo Emerson's preaching in East Lexington. Um, and. Um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the minister who got blown up on the steamship. Um, Fallon. Fallon, Fallon. Yeah, Charles Fallon. Um, so Lexington has, an, and, and of course it's the hometown of Theodore Parker. So what I tried to do in the transcendentalist in the world would be to put a question that you could put just as readily to Lexington. And that is, in 1775, people in Concord and Lexington were fighting for collective liberty, not individual liberty. They were in a communal world and seeking to re retain it. In 1835, 37, when Emerson is becoming recognized as the most eloquent spokesman for transcendentalism, he's holding out a vision of individual liberty and selfhood. So how does a town go from the revolution for collective liberty to announcing a revolution of individual selfhood and personal liberty. In both cases, I suspect, you will have a similar story of a new kind of social order taking shape in which people are acting far more fully on their self-interest than on the collective interest. And what transcendentalism does is offer people a language and a philosophy that can legitimate new areas of freedom for the individual apart from community. And this is crucial because if you've grown up under Jonas Clark or William Emerson or Ezra Ripley, if you've grown up under those ministers, you have heard over and over again a doctrine 
of interdependency, of communalism, of what you owe to your neighbor and how you should put the common good above your own personal interests. That's the rhetoric and the ideology. But even as people hold that, they're pulling away from one another and seeking to act more on their own interests. That is to say, they're acting one way, but thinking another. And they've got to figure out, can you reconcile that? Transcendentalism offers an appealingly eloquent way to reconcile that conflict because it doesn't appeal to economic self-interest. It actually condemns action on individual self-interest. And it's not a matter of you have to be born again in evangelical Protestantism. It's doing something different. It's offering an idealistic vision of individual freedom that can, if you go to the deepest core of yourself, serve the common good as well. So I think that's a story you can tell in Lexington. All right. And I think we're all still struggling with that exact same thing. Yes. This day. Right. Well, I think uh, if there are, I think we're about there. All right. Well, thank you very, very much. Robert Gross, everyone. Thank you. And buy a book. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul.